one of the um, lovely side effects of, of Anharad's fantastic talk was that the ladies in the kitchen were all dancing and crying. <laughs> um, which is lovely. They're wonderful volunteers and um, we're very grateful that they organise it so well and look after our needs for tea and coffee. And, um, but some of them haven't even heard of Gatekeeper and uh, they're, they've become really interested. So that's a very nice side effect. And now I have an enormous pleasure of introducing John Wadsworth. Um, John is a great friend of Gatekeeper. I don't know why I keep saying that really, because everyone's a great friend of Gatekeeper who speaks here, but he, he is. Um, he's a professional astrologer who runs the Kairos School of Astrology in Glastonbury and founder of the Alchemical Journey, uh, which is a mystery school based on the Glastonbury Zodiac. Um, so he's, John is going to speak this morning on turning the wheel of the Zodiac. He's a very entertaining speaker, no pressure. Um, and so I'd like to introduce John Wadsworth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's lovely to be here. Um, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? The, the spirit of pilgrimage. Um, I've done a lot of walking of sacred land over the years. I've walked to Santiago. I've just come back from the walking the St. Francis Way in Italy. And for the last um, 10 or 12 years, I've been walking regularly around the Glastonbury Zodiac with my dear friend Anthony Thorley, who I'll be mentioning at various points in this talk. And um, it all comes out of a deep conviction as an astrologer that we carry the Zodiac within us as a sort of medicine wheel. And the book I brought out in March, Your Zodiac Soul, which a lot of this, what I'll be saying is kind of in, in, the, in this book, really works on this idea that we have this inner, this inner map that we've inherited through, you know, at least 2,000, maybe or almost ever be more than that, years of, of, of this sort of cultural image, this icon, this emblem of the soul, which we've inherited through from the, from the Greeks and the Romans through the Christian tradition, and that we can work with as a way of re-enchanting our experience of ourselves and of, of the land and it can work on many levels. And I think it also, my, my big interest in it is in how it can reconnect us and help to repair the fragmentation within the psyche. And how that can then translate into how we can repair some kind of sacred order in our community and in society. And so what I'd like to do here, I'm going to do, try and do two things. One is just to introduce you a little bit of the Glastonbury Zodiac. But really I want to, uh, the second half will be more looking at a sort of whirlwind tour, just a glimpse, if you like, of... The, these 12 medicines that we can connect with. And, and perhaps, you know, some, some of you might be engaged in walking uh, in sacred zodiacal landscapes already. Some of you will have heard of them, I'm sure. Many of you will have heard of them. And, um, the Wheel of Life. Hmm? The Wheel of Life. The Wheel of Life. It is a Wheel of Life. And it's a 12-fold wheel, and we have inherited a 12-fold, as well as an 8-fold wheel. We're familiar with, with the 8-fold with the, um, with the wheel. There's a 12-fold wheel, which I'm very compelled by what's happening through astrology. And it's almost as if the zodiac itself carries within it a kind of it's incredible elegance, a symmetry, a kind of perfection in some ways. And then we get our individual birth charts, which are like a sort of map of all the, all the, the imbalances and the, and the karma and everything that we've inherited that we need to work with. It gives us our, our piece of that. But then there's this, there's this elegant system, this elegant map, which sits behind that, which we can reconnect, help to reconnect us and give context to our own individual journey. But something that, you know, something that Anthony, says Anthony here, you know, many of you will know, um, who inspired me with the actual glass, he introduced me to glass to be about 15 years ago. I was already running a programme, um, the, Al the Alchemical Journey had already been born as a, as, a, as a sort of initiatory path before I even encountered the Glastonbury um, landscape, Zodiac. Uh, but when we started working together, you know, we, and what we've been doing for, for many years now is leading group, groups through the figures, through the, through the land each, um, each month as the sun is in each sign. And working with the, the deep mythology, the symbolism, the alchemical imagery of each sign, preparing the imagination to then go out and walk the figures um, in the land so that our, our imaginations are ready to encounter the many synchronicities that we find there. So I'm going to come back and talk a bit more about that 
in a little while. But I just thought, just to summarise what I'm, you know, my, my, my take on the zodiac or the way that we can think of it as a, a turning wheel of life experience, a basis for natural and cosmic order, something about this order within which all this creative possibility can, can occur. A developmental journey through life, we can see, we can map the zodiac onto the life cycle in the same way we can lap, map it onto the body and the parts of the body. Initiatory stages, 12 initiatory stages based on the mytho seasonal cycle, the idea that there are you know, these 12 stories in the year that we can connect with. A round table map of the psyche, 12 members of our astrological imagination that are there that we can refer to for counsel, as if there is a council, a round table council within our imaginations, which if we can restore the, an awareness of that, we can take out into our lives and out into... And, and, and as we walk and as we, as we encounter any landscape, it may be that we, maybe we can, we can actually help to cohere something of this order in ourselves. And I, I talk a lot about... My, my, my big theme really is wholeness, the idea that we're born whole and complete, but that we're very quickly, early on, educated out of that wholeness and into a, a more fragmented state. And here are 12 gateways... Um, that we can, you know, restore this sense of wholeness. This is uh, Yuri, Yuri Leeson, this lovely uh, map here of the, the wheel of the year, showing the 12 signs, showing the, you know, the, um, the importance here of the, of the equinox and solstice markers. The tropical zodiac that we work with in Western astrology holds true to the equinox and solstice points in a way that Vedic astrology doesn't. Vedic moves with the gradual procession of the equinoxes and the processional cycle, so that it's more star-based, but it's less connected to the seasonal year. So I'm a great defender of the Western zodiac because it holds true to the original seasonal images of the signs of the zodiac, because they, Aries really means the spring equinox. Capricorn means the winter solstice, so that's where it belongs. And so as we enter those markers in the year, so that begins that, that point where the sun is in that sign, and then all the how that then works metaphorically down through the other planetary positions as well. So I'm a great holder to this, this idea. And really, the, um, this, is the, this is an old... Um, I really like this because it shows three things. You've got, this, you've got the image of the zodiac. You've then got the light and dark balance in the year. And then you've got the, the, the agricultural stage that each sign represents. And it reminds us that the zodiac originates as an agricultural cycle. It really develops. I think, I think astrology, uh, certainly the zodiac, develops with um, agriculture. As we settle in communities, we start to observe the movements of these 12 particular constellations around us because they are the backdrop for the sun, moon, and, star and planets. They all, because that's the path that they follow through the sky. So, so the, the sign also derives its, its, its meaning each sign from, from the light-dark balance in the year. And so we can understand it through that, as, well, as, well, as, well, as I go through it, we'll see that. Um, and of course we find zodiacs right the way through our Christian history. Here's a, here's a uh, uh, this is an interesting one, isn't it? It's a Christ figure in the centre with 12 sun rays coming out of his head, like an, almost like an Apollo, like a Christ-Apollo composite, which fits perfectly with the solar symbolism. of Christ as some kind of solar hero and then you have the four seasons around there. This is about this is the 12th century. You get a lot of these around the 12th, 13th century. Here's Sharp Cathedral, many of you will have been here. And Sharp with its famous labyrinth, and also famously uh, aligned differently than most cathedrals in Europe. It, it holds to the old pre-Christian alignment to the winter solstice, very significantly. Um, they don't tell you that when you visit there. I challenged one of the guides on this, and she... She stood, stood fast to the, that it was the traditional alignment. I mean, I wish I'd had a compass there to show that it wasn't. So it didn't. But anyway, Sharp is here. here this is the, the stained glass um, of the zodiac in Sharp Cathedral, which is showing us the same thing as we just saw on the, on the, uh, on the image from before. So the, here it's being remembered. Here you can see um, Aries here, uh, the fishes of Pisces, his Taurus Gemini that have been tucked in there somehow, and there's Cancer there. And then you've got the stage of the year here within the planting, uh, and this is the sort of spring, the spring sign, so it's within the planting cycle. 
of the year, but you know, you've got the 12 labours of the year mapped to the 12 signs, suggesting that these 12 labours are not just for our agriculture, they are for that too, but they're also for our spiritual, they're, 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 there's a metaphorical spiritual mapping for our, own, for our own journey of reconnection, to remain connected to, to the cycles of life. This is Canterbury Cathedral, I'm actually living in Canterbury at the moment, um, and this is a beautiful, these are the beautiful zodiac round aisles of Canterbury Cathedral. Um, really lovely. And, and again, these are also mapped to the Twelve Labours. So we do get this. There's also one at Rochester Cathedral as well in Kent. And, um, and you find them dotted around all over the place. And there's another one here. This is, I was here in the summer. This is San Miniato. Uh, I don't know, I didn't have the picture actually of the cathedral, but there's a San Miniato Cathedral. If you go, it's, it's right up on the top of the hill above, above Florence. And um, this, there used to be a light effect that came through at certain times of the year which would light up particular signs for particular esoteric reasons. No longer works in the same way that shark no longer works in the way it used to because they've overlit it. They've done the same here. It's almost like they're deliberately stopping the, these, these magical, um, sort of, you know, sort of ritual, almost, almost sort of psychoactive experiences from happening. And they, the... Uh, but you can still appreciate the zodiac, and it's put in a very particular place in the, in the basilica in order for this to happen. This is from the 6th century Jewish zodiac. It shows that it's also, you know, and you, find them, you, find, you also find them a lot, of course, in the, in the Islamic culture as well. So it, is, it, does, it does pervade all three of the major Western religions. And then we go back now to the Roman mystery schools. This is Mithras. This is from the... Um, uh, this is up in Northumberland. This is, this is from the Mithraeum that was found um, uh, near on Hadrian's Wall. And he got the signs of the zodiac, he got the egg born Mithras with the sounds of the zodiac around. As if, as if this figure, here's another one, beautiful, this is one's in Italy. Um, could be Mithras, could be another character called Farnes, but some kind of avatar, some kind of avatar of, of the mystery school who has some kind of perhaps mastery of the zodiac. That's the suggestion, isn't it? That there's, a, that, that there's some way in which this character has, is complete within the zodiacal wheel. And if we look at, if we look at Mithraism again a bit more, we can see that this is a toroctony. Um, the toroctony, I won't go into this, it's not really the theme, but the toroctony itself is actually a cosmological map. So you, you, could, you can see the whole um, the bull slaying scene and the characters around it. It, it does actually depict... Um, a number of constellations in that part of the sky where, where Taurus is. Um, and then you've got the zodiac here around. This is the one in London. Um, Walbrook, Mithraeum. And then if, if we go, this is, this is uh, in Rome. There's a typical sort of underground chamber, Mithraic, Mithraic temple. You've got the Tauroctony here. You can just see it on, on there. And then around here, you've got where the, where the um, initiates of the mystery school would sit. And Roger Beck has shown that this was aligned to the zodiac and the planets, and there's a particular way of doing it. And quite possibly, they were, they, it seems as though they were, they were honouring different signs at different times of the year as they went through the year, seeking to embody the wisdom, the medicine of each one, which is, in a way, what we're trying to do with the alchemical journey. Um, this is John Michel, uh, wonderful advocate of this idea. With the beginning of civilization, the number 12 rose naturally to prominence. Founders and reformers of civilization have constantly detected a 12-part pattern in the heavens and have brought that pattern to earth in the form of zodiacal landscapes and 12-tribe societies. We, we can see that in the, the 12 tribe nations, a wonderful book that he did with, with Christine Rome, where he shows that how many, how many uh, land, how many societies were organized around the 12. So the 12, um, like there were, there, were, there were 12 sections, there were 12... Uh, regions of an island, for example, all around a central point. And he's shown how this is the case. Um, I've been working in Jersey a lot recently, and there's 12, 12 districts in Jersey that some, I'm just, at the moment just starting to look at whether there's a zodiacal pattern there. There probably will be, because there's something about when you get, when, when, when a twelveness occurs, a zodiacal pattern starts to emerge, and this is a really interesting theme. Here's Catherine Morwood, here's the Glastonbury Zodiac. This is a map that... Um, we managed to get hold of it. We, we believe is her original, one of her original maps. Anthony now has it. It's a huge, great thing. And it has the, on the back of it uh, are the stars, and it shows how the stars map onto the signs on the ground. 
And um, in this way, here, this is the, the mapping. So this is, when she started to discover this, she started to see figures. She was looking for Arthurian stories at first, and then started to realize that a, a, a zodiacal pattern was emerging. And um, she started with the lion. She discovered the lion at Leo, which was just here, first of all. Um, this is the River Carey that she saw this. And then it, it's made up, the, the, the figures are made up of rivers and old trackways and roads and so on. And, um, and each, each figure, as, she, as, they, as they started to emerge, she realized that she was finding all kinds of synchronicity in the land, in the places, in the names of streets, in local legends, and so on. But that it conformed extraordinarily to this, to this pattern, particular stars on particular places, and so on. This is Mary Kane's image, and she's shown how it, how it maps down. So these, these 12 can also be seen as 12 um, members of the round table in the Arthurian tradition, too. Here we are, walking on a lovely... It well, we didn't always look like this when we're walking the land. We walk on some pretty grotty, torrential down, because it always seems to rain on Pisces, which always seems somehow appropriate. <laughs> So I think this is walking down all over hill at Compton Dundon, the Gemini figure. And here's a winter walk we're doing. I think this is the Aquarius. Well, this is the Aquarius figure, yeah. I've got a little bit image that um, last to be tour there enigmatically um, hanging over us. It's a 12-mile circle, the Glastonbury Zodiac. So it's not just in Glastonbury itself, but Glastonbury is the Aquarius figure and the Pisces figure on the other side of the town as well. And there are others, of course. This is Mary Kane's Kingston Zodiac. So Mary Kane, who did so much work on the Glastonbury Zodiac, and in a way kept it going. Um, she carried on the work, really, after Catherine Mole would die. And um, she discovered the Kingston Zodiac, which was around her own area. Um, it was interesting, wasn't it, just thinking in that last talk as well, thinking about how you know, we need to be mindful to our own, to place where we are, the place where we live, and that, and that area around us. And so to find a Zodiac in your own place, where you live, of course, is more meaningful. And Mary Kane lived in Kingston and discovered a, a very, lots of very similar themes, as if you know, she'd taken the, the, the inspiration you know, of the Zodiac, of the Glastonbury Zodiac, and then found something very similar in the land around Kingston. And all kinds of similar themes come out. Um, a guardian dog, this is a feature of both um, the Glastonbury Zodiac and the Kingston Zodiac, uh, perhaps. Uh, Canis Major, and lots of, you know, lots of ideas of a dog guard, you know, guarding the sacred place, the place of the underworld, the place of that other world inspiration. Here's the dog here on the left. So we've got um, the Hebden Bridge Zodiac. Interestingly, the, the figures going the other way are actually, um, are actually rotating the other direction here, which is the way that the sun the way that the sun would, uh, the way that the constellations would actually travel through the sky. But we, our zodiacs are always map the way that the planets move against the back of the zodiac. That's how we, that's how we depict the zodiac. But this has gone back just to the, the way they would be seen in the sky, interestingly. <coughs> very different, look, aren't they? I mean, they're all a bit, they're quite odd, aren't they, these? You know, but they're all very different in the way they're depicted. Um, but I'm sure that, you know, I don't know, this is John Billingsley. I don't know too much about his zodiac, but... Um, There'll be, there'll be similar features throughout all of them. This is the Bodmin Moor Zodiac, Nigel Ayres. He's very much into psychic geography. The idea that you can take a, 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 a template and a, a map of one place and you can sort of transplant it onto another. He's done, he, he, put, he, he did this experiment with, uh, a tube, took a tube map in Berlin and then tried to use this tube map to, to, to navigate in London, I think it was, to see if, it, if the tube, if the Berlin tube map would actually work in London, and all kinds of extraordinary things happen. <laughs> so he finally could find his way around London using the tube map. Of Berlin. Interesting idea, and it sort of links in somehow. I think this was the inspiration for him to discover this zodiac. So, you know, that, 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 we, that we have these internal maps, and that somehow they help us to navigate in the world in actual places. This is, which brings us to this extraordinary zodiac, this is the Qing Road zodiac. This is the astrologer John Addy, who, being an astrologer and, being, and, and having discovered the Glastonbury zodiac, thought it would be interesting just to, just to see if it was a zodiac on his street. And so, being a Cancerian, he took, he, he took his, his house as council and looked at the houses around him. And next door, which was the Gemini house, he found, he found a, a, a pair of twins living there. And next to that, in the Taurus house, they had this. 
beautifully preserved garden and they, and, they were, and they were growing their own food. And then the next time there was a guy living on his own in the Aries house, uh, a guy from the, who'd been in the army, military man. And the next door there was a, a, dr uh, a, a drunken old priest living in the, uh, in the Pisces house. And it all seemed to fit. But what was even more, what was then, what was then sort of even more interesting and controversial is that he thought, well, what, what if I was the Aries house? I think he, he took one of his other positions in his ch own chart. And then realised that the that the um, the that the, uh, that the Gemini house next door could also be another sign, could be that could be um, so he sort of shifted everything around. I think the Taurus, the Taurus one then became the Aquarian one because they were doing some great humanitarian project, and the and you know so he found other so it was it wasn't as if it was a fixed thing, but it was as if what he realised and what, what was so interesting about it was that it was there was some kind of way that his own imagination was able to perceive this zodiacal order around him. Um, so it does, it, then it raises some interesting questions around what a zodiac actually is. Because when we look at them, when we work with them, they, it looks like somebody built them. You know, you look at the glass of these early, it's so coherent, it's so soaked in synchronicity, you think somebody must have made this thousands of years ago with this knowledge. And then you find all kinds of things that you know you can't really explain. And part of the glass of the zodiac was underwater until you know a few hundred years ago. So Kathy Maltwood, what Kathy Mal when Kathy Maltwood said it was made two thousand seven hundred years ago, is she is, does she believe that? Is she sort of playing with us a little bit? Who knows? But there seems to be something a bit more mysterious going on that seems more like a sort of co a co imagining or a co dreaming with the land. That it's in us and it's in the land, and we're somehow tuned to see it because this this emblem of the zodiac is somehow deeply woven into the psyche. Right, a few little a few little stories from the Glastonbury zodiac. So, this is the Aries figure. Um, it's a it's a ram with, uh, or it's, it's the classic sort of ram or lamb with it, with its head reverted, and then you've got the pi pi part of the Pisces figure coming out of the of the ram's head, or the Aries figure's head. And this is, if anyone's been to Street near Glastonbury, this is Street High Street. And um, we call it Synchronicity Street. Because it is, you walk up there and all kinds of amazing things happen. The first time we ever, the first time we ever walked up there um, on, the, on the alchemical journey, it was the first weekend we'd ever done, there was a construction company, just at that point where the, on the tip of the... Of the use, your, use your red Yeah, I'll use the thing, sorry. A, so just here, there was a construction company called Ram Construction. They were making, they were only there for three weeks, but they were there for the, for the time that we were walking. A big red sign, unmissable. And Street's interesting because it's the, the home of Clark Shoes. Pisces rules the feet. So you've got Clark Shoes there, but Clark originally made sheepskins. So, and, they, and, and, they made, and, the, and where they made the sheepskins, the warehouses are on the airy side of the street. And then when one of the brothers split off and, and started to make slippers, he crossed over the other side of the street, which is the Pisces side. So you have the sheepskins being made on the airy side and the, and the shoemaker on the other side, on the Pisces side. There, there's um, one of the best fish and chip shops in Somerset is on the Pisces side. There's, a, there's, a, there's an angling shop there. There's a shop called Weird Fish. And there was even a, for a while, and, we, and, and it was only there for about a year, but it was there one of the years that we walked it. There was, they, they, there was a therapy centre with the little fish that, that bite the bottoms of the soles. Oh, yeah. So and I went in there. I said, "Have you got any? Did you know you were on the Pisces figure of the Glass of Zodiac?" She had no idea at all. So people are doing this unconsciously. They've got no idea what they're doing. There's a hairdressing school in in um, in Street, and there are, there are a disproportionate number of hairdressers, and they're all on the airy side of the. It's just airy towards the head. They're all on the airy side of the street. You know what's going on, and. Um, and then you got this. This, this popped up last year on the airy side of the street. You know, it's, uh, you know what's happening? You know, there's Mr. Shepherd, the dentist. There's Mr. Shepherd, the butcher. There's, on the airy side, you know, they seem to know which side to go. Hard, hard to sort of explain. Nobody knows what they're doing, of course. But there's something happening, and we're, but how, it's so much fun to be able to. But there's something profound going on, isn't there? That we, that, that, you know, that. Would, would these even, I mean, who knows, would they even have started up here if we hadn't sort of stirred all this up? Um, this is the Leo figure, the first figure that Catherine Mulder discovered. Um, here's the head up at Copley Wood here. And um, there's all sorts of play, interesting place names. There's Cat's Ash, there's Kingsdon, um, lots of places with sort of, it's Cats and Kings really um, around here. And you've got Somerton on the poor. 
Now, Somerton used to be, they make a big deal of this, it was at the royal capital of ancient West. Apparently, it was only the capital for one year. But they did make a big thing of it in Somerton. There isn't much to Somerton, really, but, but there is this, it does have this royal kind of sphere. And of course, there's a crown, you know, there's this, there's this very impressive monument in the centre of the town, and there's a crown on the sign as you walk in. It all feels rather grand. And then, and then you, and you put the red line. It's lots of, red line is the most common name of a pub. So it's not such a, but, but there was a big statue. I found this image of a, a statue of a lion there, in the, in, right in the, in the heart of Somerton in the square. Um, and then, and um, this is interesting, on one of our walks, we found this, we found this unbelievably huge paw print that was far too big. This is in Leo, in the woods, on the Leo walk. And there was only one, there, was no, there wasn't another one, it was just one huge paw print. And somebody had found a bit of a joke with us and had gone and made it, you know, to have a laugh. But it was in the middle of, in this wood that nobody ever goes in, really, so... And no one could really, we were all very exciting. So we, we, couldn't, we couldn't really, uh, we thought maybe it was one of those big cats, you know, that just sort of step in uh, reality and just, 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 just say hello. And there it was, you know, and they had to find it in the Leo figure, of course. Um, this is a Sagittarius figure, it's one of the biggest figures in the Zodiac. <clears throat> this is Osmond Cain, who's Mary Cain's husband, who made these beautiful um, sort of mosaic images of the Zodiac figures. This is actually in the King Arthur pub in, in Glastonbury now. Um, here it is a close-up of it. And um, we're going to just focus on this area around the head here. Just here. Because from here, the, the bird is Libra. Bird, um, Libra is, Libra is um, represented as a dove in the zodiac. And this is the point. So this is where we were just looking there. Just here, where the bird <coughs> flies out of the sort of third eye, really. We call it the third eye point of the the Sagittarius figure. There's a place called Boltonsborough Flights. That's interesting, isn't it? Boltonsborough Flights. Here it is. It's a, it's a waterfall, or sort of, you know, kind of a weir. Probably called the flight because it looks like a flight of stairs. But it's a flight. It's a, the, the, Libra, the Libra bird is flying out of it. You've got the flights of the Sagittarian arrow, you know. So you've got this kind of, it's sort of somehow referencing both Sagittarius and Libra at one of these very interesting points where two signs meet in the wheel. And it's a powerful point, and um, Serena Roni Dougal, as many of you all know, she discovered that, that she actually identified third eye points on all the figures, and there were water features on these third eye points in all the figures. Catherine Mulwood never mentions this, but of course people are finding things all the time which seem to um, point to the, to, to, the, to the image. This is Mary Kane's map. And I just want to point out this. Another point where two signs meet here, this is a bit of fun, this is the Capricorn figure here. This is Pontus Ball, which we always walk along, very special place, sort of a, yeah. And then we've got the Aquarian, this is the, this is the, uh, li the Aquarian bird, it's a phoenix bird. Uh, there's a whole story of why Aquarius is symbolised by a phoenix bird, but there's this point where the, where the goat of Capricorn meets the wing of, of the bird. And one year we were walking and we, we found this. In the, in the garden of a house called the wing. And it's right there. It's right at the point. This is the wing here. And this, is, this house, this is the house where it is. It's called the wing because it's the wing of a bigger house, right? It's the wing of a house. But it's right on the wing, and there's a goat statue. And we asked her why a goat, you know, if she knew anything about, she didn't know anything about the Zodiac. Uh, but funnily enough, Jeff Stray, who many of you will know, lives in the house next, he lives here, right next door to it. So he lives at that point. And he knew, he, knew, he knew about the wing, but he never made that connection. He didn't know there was a goat in the garden. But there was, but we actually, we, she, she very kindly let us do a little ritual one year around the goat, still on the Capricorn. But isn't it, you know, it's just, you know, these, it's, it's kind of, what's going on, you know? There's, and, and, and we've got countless other stories, I just wanted to give you a few, just to kind of whet your appetite a little bit. But, you know, and, so the beauty of it is that it's an evolving thing. We're finding things all the time, but our imaginations are primed to look for these things. This is the point. Um, and this is, uh, I've just done a close-up here just to show you the centre. We always want to know about the centre of things. This is the centre of uh, the Blastery Zodiac, the Park Wood. And um, some of you might have been here. It's quite a special place, you know, we've had some extraordinary experiences there. You know, it's just like a sort of a sort of axis mundi of the whole, of the whole sort of temple of the stars. And um, here it is again on the, the map, you can see it. This is, the, this is where Park Wood would be, right at the centre of the thing, the wheel here, and 
This is the ecliptic center, which is slightly different. The center of the zodiac is the ecliptic center, slightly different to the pole star. And shows here. This is one of Anthony's, one of Anthony's maps. Um, so here's the pole star here. We can see that's the center of the sky, the point that you know that, that doesn't move. But this is part of a bigger circle. This is the processional circle here. So at the moment we have a pole star here, but we won't always have, and we haven't always had, because this is moving every 26,000 years. Every point on this circle will become the pole star. And at certain points, there'll be stars, but only occasionally. We're very kind of, you know, fortunate at the moment to have a star that's actually... Amazing that, isn't it? In 26,000 year cycle, only twice do we have a star on the pole star, what we do at the moment. But it's not the centre of the zodiac. The centre of the zodiac is here. This is the centre of the ecliptic. And it's a, it's a special point because it's unaffected by procession. It's, it's, it's one of the... Um, there are, there are, there are, it's the only point really in the sky that's unaffected by procession because everything turns around it. It's always there in the same place. There's no star there. But around it, this is the constellation of Draco, the dragon. And the thing with Draco is that it has a piece of its body in every single sector of the wheel. Now, I, I, I've never heard anyone else say this, but I, I can, people talk a lot about the 13th sign. I consider Draco to be the 13th sign because it, it wraps itself around the centre and it has a piece of its body in each of the 12 signs. So there's something very profound in that, mythologically, I think, because I think that, that, there's, a, that there's a... You know, I talked earlier about this idea that we are... We're, we're kind of repairing the integrity of the wheel. In order to do that, we have to face the dragon. We have to face... This is also, this is also the serpent in, Christi in the Christianized cosmos. This is the serpent. This is the Garden of Eden here. And this is you know, the unchanging, the eternal. And this is the serpent in the Garden of Eden that holds the knowledge. And that knowledge is held somewhere... In, uh, in, in, in our own serpent or dragon nature. Serpent is the same root as seraph. Right. As in seraphim. Okay, great, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's, really, that's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, the, it and and they sit, there seems to be something interchangeable as well in this type, type of energy that we need to connect. Something in the power of the serpent energy, the, the dragon energy, that holds perhaps the, sh the, perhaps this, the, the, the shadow key to how we reconnect. Because... As I'm going to show in a moment, we're going to go, I'm going to give you this, this sort of glimpse of each sign now. But as we do, and the only, the only real way to, and the real work is in, is in noticing where we are, where, where we are um, expressing the shadow aspect of each of these 12 essential perspectives or truths, where that part that we need to reintegrate. You know, so, you know, I'm going to give us a, I'm going to, I'm going to present us with a, with a beautiful mantra for each sign, a truth that we can, that we can sort of allow to land in our being, but also just, just hint at where the shadow is, where we, because we're getting stuck. We're, if this is a turning wheel that's meant to turn within us in order to create the balance and harmony within us, then there's a, there's something which is getting stuck, perhaps at each point, where we, where we, where we're out of balance, where we, where we, where we're not fully authentic in that place, and it's, the, and it's the, where the fear arises in us. And it's in, it, I think it's, this is the shadow work of astrology, of, of the zodiac, to, to, to reintegrate and reconnect with, because that, that shadow energy, because within it is the transforming power. The transforming power lies, I think, in this, in this 13th sign, this deeply feminine, and this, the, the, the 13th sign always gets, always gets shunted out, doesn't it? There's 13, we know there's 13, there's 13, the moon goes through the zodiac 13 times a year. And the sun goes through it 12 times a year. So there's a 13thness that keeps getting missed. And I think the 13thness is right at the very heart, right at the very centre of the zodiac. You know, we have this, you know, we could say, well, there are 13 constellations on the ecliptic ring, which there are. We have a 13th constellation called Ophiuchus. Funnily enough, Ophiuchus carries a serpent, he's the serpent holder. So we can't really get away from it. There's a the thirteenth sign is a, is a serpent or a dragon, and you know I think there's, a, there's something at the heart of it here, which is a big clue for us. There's actually a dragon legend um, in Park Wood. So there's a dragon that's said to guard the wood. Is that interesting? So it's right there in the land for us to learn from. So in my book, this is this is my book, Your Zodiac Soul, which is which is where where, where we go through and, and, and encounter each of these of these. Um, 
medicines in turn and, and the shadow that, that, that goes along with them. And so in the time I've got left, I want to just give us this, this little tour of the wheel and um, with some nice images from, from Yuri Leach, who's creating a, a, a calendar for us, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, so we begin with Aries, the first sign. The sign that, that the, the, the fire sign, the, the, the spark of life that, that, that awakens us. The ram, or the, or the seasonal lamb, springtime lamb, the one that comes with unbounded energy and enthusiasm and innocence, that bounds into life without any thought of the consequence. Okay, we all recognize that. Whether, I mean, I'm an Aries, this is familiar to me. Some of you may be also, but you may have Aries somewhere in your chart. You may think Aries are terrible, and they're, you know, and, you know, and they're, they're, they're difficult and abrasive and brash and everything else, which we are, of course, as well. And we all, we all have that within us. We all have that energy within us. Can we reclaim it? Because we need it. If we're going to begin anything, we need to be able to access the spark in us and be aware when that spark is too strong, when it burns out of control and when, it, and when it's destructive, which is the shadow of Aries. But here's the... It's fire. Can we connect with our fire? Can we connect with the initiating fire um, of the ram, of the energy of the ram? So, so prominent the head of this figure. We have Athena here, the, the, the Olympian representative of, of, of Ares on Mount Olympus, who is born out of Zeus's head. You know, her, 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 she becomes the goddess of wisdom, but also of military strategy. She has this clarity and this fiery insight. Um, here we have the ram heads of Karnak, you know, symbolizing the age of Ares when the, when the, during, the, during that period where, the, where Ares was on the spring equinox point, where we had you know, ram, ram head cults and so on, also in Greece with, with Zeus being ram headed. There we have the golden fleece image, um, you know, Jason and the argument of Jason, very Aryan character, and so on. So um, the, the mythology is a way into it, and, and the, the, the book is is rich in all the mythology of the signs and shows how the, the myths are a, a, a way of dreaming back into the medicine of the sign. And the, and the Greek and Roman myths particularly are very useful in this, in this regard, also the Egyptian myths. Um, but here we are, it's, 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 it's like the bud in spring. It's, it's got this one thing it's got to do, which is to burst into life. You know, in that same way that you know, give an Aries one thing to do and they'll be all right. You know, don't, give, don't make it complicated. <laughs> Keep it simple, and let, let it be about the expression of energy, of life force. That that's all. That's what matters at that point. You know, life has to come back out of the slumber of winter. It needs to express itself, and it needs to come in full with its full power, focused in this bud. So the bud is such a beautiful image. I think of Aries. I love the sort of the redness here as well. The fiery, the fiery quality here. Light is overtaking dark in the year. And we begin the astrological year at this point. Um, we often show this image um, on the alchemical journey to, to us students what we think is going on here. It looks at, at first as though this, this, this figure is about to do, do great violence to this beautiful, perfect egg, doesn't it? You know, and therein there, there might, be, might be a shadow energy of, of Aries, as if his sword is about to come down and, 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 and destroy everything. And, and, but, we, but after a while of meditating on it, we realise that the poise in this figure, if you look at the how, how he's so trained on the egg, as if we have a furnace here indicating that, that, that this is an alchemical fire, a tunnel that maybe represents the birth canal, something about birth and the egg, as if the egg itself may be ready to, to crack open under its, own, under its own forces, under its own will, and that somehow this, this figure needs to bring the sword down at the exact moment, perhaps, when the egg would break open under its own means. Thus not exacting any force upon it, but just timing his moment so that the masculine comes down as the feminine is ready to come out. Uh, so I think it's a beautiful, I'm, I'm convinced that that is at the, at the heart of what this image is about. And, and it's, uh, that, 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 that gives you that idea of the kairos, the right moment to act, which is really what the Aries medicine is about. It's about knowing, being so tuned in, so connected in to the spiritual spark of life that you know when to act and how to act in the moment with full conviction. And here's the mantra for Aries. I am here, I am now, fully present as I am. I am here, I am now, fully present as I am. That's what's called from us. When, we're, when that en Aries energy is called from us, that's where we, what we need to access, that, that, that here-ness, that now-ness, 
and that readiness to act in the moment, as if this is the only moment. Taurus, the second sign. Couldn't be more different than Aries. As if all of that energy expended in Aries now had an, 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 a spark of life that's come from the heavens, now has to land fully in the body, in the sensuous experience of life. The bull, the great bull of heaven. This is the second image from the zodiac calendar. Yuri is creating these beautiful, it's creating these beautiful zodiac images. Let me show you which of them. And, and um, it's part. Of, we're going to have a calendar that actually starts at the spring equinox. It doesn't just go through the year from January. It actually, it's, it's organised in, in an astrological year as opposed to the, the Gregorian calendar. And um, and uh, it's going to be a colouring exercise. People can colour, colour it in as well. So that's why they're not in colour. Um, but here we have the Hathor heads. Here Hathor, uh, the great. Uh, the, the great Egyptian cow of heaven, you know, who, who fed, whose milk fed the, the pharaoh, you know, and, and, and the immortality of her milk and so on. And the, this idea of the, for us, is all about how, how life feeds us and how we are fed by life. It connects us with, with the earth, with the good earth. It slows us right down so that we can really feel everything in our senses. And there's nothing like, you know, being in the presence of a bull to feel the sensuous nature of life. We've run into one or two bulls actually on our tourist walks, funnily enough. There are five cattle farms on the, on the, uh, in Compton, Dundon, on the, walk, on, the, uh, on the walk that we do up there. And uh, you, you, can, you can just feel the bull and the cow energy around. Um, and here we have the age, of, the age of Taurus, which is going back to the Cretan times. And of course, the, the Cretan bull myths. Bull myths pervade the whole Cretan story. And it, it is an older civilization. And there's the labyrinth there to remind us of that, and to also remind us of the shadow of Taurus, because the, the, minor, the story of the Minotaur is the great teaching story of Taurus that I tell in the book, you know, this, where the, the, king becomes, you know, the king is given this gift of a, of, a, of a white bull that will guarantee the prosperity of the land, but he covets it, and you know, because it brings such prosperity, he won't sacrifice it as he's supposed to a year later. So his wife is driven mad with a curse, and she falls in love, and has this incredible lust for the bull. <coughs> she then mates with the bull in this unholy kind of union, and the minotaur is born. And this minotaur has this insatiable appetite that cannot be met in any way. No matter how many virgins are sent over from the mainland to be fed to it, it still wants more and more and more and more. A great shadow teaching story, ominous shadow teaching story for our age, of course, but the greed of, of talks, of, they were happy, happy with I'll come back to those. Um, here, isn't this great? This is, this is Wall Street. This is the symbol of Wall Street. Really, and sums it up. The bull market. The bull comes to be a symbol of prosperity, but of, but of, but of, but when it's out of balance, it's just insatiable. It cannot. Its, it's appetite cannot be met, and we end up in, in, in all kinds of shadow territory, as opposed to just celebrating the blossom, which is really the gift of Taurus, the blossom of the May. So as if that, that bud now has just blossomed and we get this gift. And so for this season we're just sort of, you know, and our senses are just filled with the blossom, the Taurus, and the, and the, this is the, the, the Beltane ceremony from last year in Glastonbury. So, you know, a great time of feasting, of, 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 of sexual awakening, of sensuality that Taurus is really all about. And really, Taurus is a medicine of gratitude. It's being grateful for what we have. So when we're fully grateful for what we have, we, we, we cease to want more because we're actually, why would we want more if we have everything we need here? And we're so out of balance in that, in that perspective, aren't we? <clears throat> I am fully embodied here in gratitude for the sensuality of this moment. I am fully embodied here in this moment and the sensuality of this moment. Yes. This is a great story of teaching. Gemini. It all changes again. And here it really changes because we're here we're in the sign of change. The air sign. We've gone from fire to earth. Now we're in the element of air. And with the air come, come the pollinators, the bees and the butterflies that represent Gemini, drawn perhaps by the blossoms of Taurus, but as the winds of Gemini come and blow the blossoms from the trees, so everything is changing. And this time of change, this great hubbub of change that happens in, in the May-June time of the year, 
and the diversity and the variety. So here, here, we're, here we're connecting with the medicine of diversity in Gemini and of the communication and the, and the pollination of, of everything in flux, everything in movement. You know, there's, there's, a, there's an inconsistency and an inconstancy in Gemini, but necessarily so because we need to keep moving and changing. This is the time of the year where we need to be n not settling. We settled in Taurus a bit. You know, we have to land and ground and become just just feel the good earth. But now there's so much happening. There's so much changing. There's so much activity. There's a lot of news coming in. Gemini brings the news, just as the bees and butterflies bring the news of summer. There's the lovely image here of the twins, the Dioscuri twins. Castle and Pollux, one mortal, one divine, one in the other world, one in this world. As if, as if we're born with a part of us that didn't incarnate, that we're trying to make a connection with all the time. You know, I always think of a child and, and their invisible friend. That invisible friend is like the spirit twin, I think. That, I think, you know, we could say, well, how does a child learn to communicate? Well, we, well, they learn from their mothers, they learn from the people around them. Yes, they do, but I think there's another relationship going on which isn't to do with that. I think there's a there's a trying to communicate with the, with the immaterial part of us to keep that dialogue open. And, you know, and, and, and our, of course our, our culture tries to close that down very early on. And really to our cost. So how do we reawaken really and reconnect with that? How do we reconnect with that spirit twin that we all have? And the shadow of Gemini, of course, is when, I, I call it loose talk and gossip, you know, when, when, when language itself, when we forget that language is the thing which creates reality, that our words are sacred vehicles of intention. So, so Gemini really carries the medicine of how we speak and bring the world into being through our speech, how we take a thought and, and, and that thought becomes manifest in some way. We forget how powerful we are with, and how, how powerful our word is. And we, and we just flitter it away, don't we? We flitter it away in loose talk and gossip, and we talk about the world, we talk about other people. I, I, I'm convinced that in earlier times, language was used not to talk about the world, but to speak to the world, to speak to life itself. To, it, was, it, was a, it was a form of sacred communication and invocation. And so just noticing the way that we use language is a big part of the Gemini teaching a part of the Gemini lesson, so that we can again become kind of channels of sacred information and, communi and let, our, let our language formulate around that, that powerful intention that we carry, the intention, the intention that ideally we seed in Aries. So we seed the intention in Aries, we ground it in Taurus, in gratitude, and we express it as, sacred word, as our sacred word in Gemini. I'm a messenger of light, a conduit for the voice of my spirit twin to be heard, and a messenger of light. We often, Gemini is often talked about in the esoteric teachings as the, as a, as, as the festival of light, uh, associated with Christ, actually, and the Christ child in the Glastonbury Zodiac. I didn't show you the Gemini figure, but the, the, the Gemini figure was often seen as the Christ child. This is how Catherine Hogwood, or Mary Kay, certainly worked with it in that way. Um, so there's something here of, 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 of being able to be that messenger of light and through that to communicate with the spirit twin. Cancer. The water sign. So we've gone from fire to earth to air to water. And water connects us with feeling. If, if, if the, the air element, if, if, if fire is spirit, that sort of that fiery creative spirit, and earth is our body and the land and the ground and the good earth, and Gemini is an air sign, the air of communication and, and the way we are socially connected, intellectually stimulated, and the way our ideas are formed in the air. So water brings us into our feelings and into memory and into the, the water that runs through us, those, those, those underground streams that Maria was talking about yesterday, you know, the deep water within us. Is, in, is the deep water of the, of the, of the water signs, and, and it takes us into the soul. You know, James Hillman and others have talked about how spirit takes us up, and water takes us down into the depths, into the, into the underworld, into the underground of our being. It seeps into us. Cancer the crab that moves in this sort of, you know, 
what looks like a kind of slightly uncertain direction, maybe one forward, two to the side, one back, but sort of like a dance, almost like it's dancing. I often think of the crab, I imagine a crab on the seashore sort of moving with the tides backwards and forwards as if there's a moon waxing and waning above it, you know, the moon ruling cancer. And so it's as if, as if this kind of lunar tidal dance with this sign, and it's that sensitivity to our own mood, to the menstrual cycle, to the moon cycle, to that movement of water within us, which is so sensitive and also needs to be protected at times, so that you know, there is this sort of nurturing energy that cancer brings with it. Um, it was a crab, a crab in the in the Greek tradition and a scarab in the in the Egyptian tradition, the scarab beetle, and. Uh, Here's the scarab here. There's a lovely size show. It's a very lovely story about the scarab. Some of you might know this. But um, the scarab uh, rolls this ball of dung every 28 days. And um, it does it in this very interesting rhythm. And its young are born out of this ball of dung that it rolls. And it may have seemed to the Egyptians that, 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 that this was a sort of, you know, a birth that didn't require any, any male insemination. So it was kind of like almost like a parthenogenic, parthenogenetic birth. Um, but it rolled every 28 days. There's a link with the moon. But even more profoundly, what's been found recently is that the scarab, and crabs also do this, interestingly, they, they, are, um, they navigate according to the moon. But on, on dark moon nights, the scarab has been shown to navigate with the, to the stars of the Milky Way. There's an amazing paper written about this by someone who studied this. And so and the Milky what's the Milky Way? Well the Milky Way is well, Milky Way is many things and many cultures, but it but it has this connection with with our way home, the way back, you know, the way the, the perhaps the path that we travel between lives. But I call it the Milky Way back home because it seems to point back to the origins of things, back to the origins of life. You know, we can look into the heart of the Milky Way and see the centre of our own galaxy. But we, but we can also see this, this, you know, this turning, this river of life that we flow along. It seems to be taking us home. The scarab seems to, seems to, so its navigation seems to know the way. We can become crabby, of course, as well. It's part of the Cancerian shadow, and we can become too protective, can't we? We can, we can become too fearful. This is this is how cancer sort of expresses the shadow. But it's that part of us that is afraid to come out of the shell. You know, it might be too dangerous. So we build walls around us, we, we encase ourselves in homes and buildings, and we build security around us in order to protect us from what? What we feel is a threat. And if, and if we're too much in the Cancerian shadow as a culture, then we become very isolated in, our, in, in, in what we build around us, and very insular and very patriotic and very, you know, kind of nationalistic. These are all parts of, of the Cancerian shadow that we've forgotten, in a way, that connection. And that, that requires an openness. It requires us to actually come out of our shell, to some extent, and just let that vulnerability which exists within us be known. But of course, if we can do that in a sacred way, and, and I think that the, the, the Council of Medicine is about building sanctuary, but connecting with the sanctuary within, connecting with the sanctuary without, going and sitting by a spring. This is good Council of Medicine. Feeling into the water of the earth and where it's originating, where it's coming from. I'm connected to the source of my being, and I remember my origins. This is the deep work of cancer. I'm connected to the source of my being, and I remember my origins. I remember where I come from. And the, cancerian, the Cancerian will ask you first, when you, meet, when you meet somebody who's typically Cancerian, they won't ask you who you are. They'll ask you where you come from. Perhaps in the way that we used to, you know, centuries ago, the first question wasn't who you are. We didn't want to know who you were. We wanted to know what your tribe was, where your family was, and where you're from. And indigenous societies still would do that, of course. You know, it's like, what, where, where, where are you from? What, what land are you from? Who are your ancestors? These are Cancerian questions. It's important that we reconnect with that medicine. Leo. Leo brings us out, really brings us out of our shell, right? The right out of our shell, man, Leo. And if we've, but if we've really landed it within, in, in the Cancerian perspective, we've really connected deeply with the roots of us, then we can come out confidently and express ourselves in that Leonine way. We can take the center stage that Leo asks us to do. We can become heroic. This is the heroic part of the wheel. And it's where we access the, the hero archetype, the lion. 
this grand figure in the sky, this dominating figure, has this bright star, Regulus, sits right on the ecliptic, regulating everything, being the ruler. It's the first, it's the first, um, so the first effigy that Catherine Mulwood discovers in most zodiacs, actually, the most landscape zodiac, almost all of them, it's the Leo figure that gets, that gets recognised first. That, that theme is carried on as well through the discovery of, of the lion and the lamb. And um, it's the time of lunar sun in, in the year. Here are the sunflowers. It's the time you know, where everything is growing, where there's this beautiful flowering brightness, there's a lightness here. So this is another interesting point, actually, that there are, that there are, that there are 12, I'm just sort of hinting at them here, but we look at the 12 ceremonies in Christianity, and we can also look them back through the pagan ceremonies. There are, there are, there are astrological themes right the way through um, that, that correspond. But we can think of the sunflower with her head turning towards the sun. It's a beautiful Leo symbol. Here's the lion here. Here's the Hercules, the great Leonine hero. His most famous labor is the slaying of the Nemean lion. He wears a lion um, pelt and the head, head, the headdress there. We've got Apollo up here. God associated with, with the sun, solar, this is the solar energy, so sort of the sun Lord in Leo. We've got Bast here, this protective energy, deeply um, deep feminine wisdom. We've got Sekhmet as well, sort of hinted at here in the, in the head of the lion too, that ferocious aspect of, of the lion in Egypt, which probably would have represented in some way the, the heat of the midday sun, the burning effect of that incredible heat of, of the midday sun in the summer in Egypt. And then Bast, the more, you know, the kinder, um, more peaceful aspect of, of Sekhmet there as well. So there's something here that, that like the lion demands respect, demands authority, takes a sort of natural authority in the same way that the solar part of us does. So we need to be able to honour this. And of course it can rage out of control and we can become dominators and dictators when, when we're in the shadow of this. But we can also become coward. We can also become cowardly, right? This, this is a lovely story, isn't it? In the Wizard of Oz, the cowardly lion, who, who, who can't really step into his Leo nature. And there's something that we have to also find our courage. Leo is a medicine of courage. It's the heroic energy. There are times when we need to step up and, and, and show who we are. And, be, and, and we need to be who we are. We need to, you know, that need for... Um, the recognition of our, of our true nature. And of course there's a lovely moment then at the end of the story when they've followed the Yellow Brick Road and they've met the wizard and the wizard gives him a badge of courage and recognises him as the lion that he is. Sort of almost giving him permission there. So there's some way in which we need to be given permission to be ourselves. On the alchemical journey we used to, um, we used to use this big hall in, um, near Glastonbury and we used to roll a big red carpet down the middle of it and each person would get to walk along the red carpet and be crowned at the end of it. They would a big throne, and I'd, I'd play a big dramatic piece of music, and then they'd get to the end, and I'd look at their chart, and, I, and we'd all kind of kneel before them and hail them as the king or the queen for that, for that moment. And we'd look at the chart and say, what kind of a kingdom this, would, this might be with this person in charge. And it sounds wonderful, doesn't it? What a lovely thing to do. It was the most triggering exercise of the whole year. <laughs> we spent a whole session just processing all of the things. It was really intense. And, but, you know, it, which says a lot, doesn't it, about you know, how, we, how we handle that, you know, that, that sovereignty. This is, our, you know, this is about being sovereign in our own being. So important. I am as I am, and I shine from the centre of my being. That's Leo. Virgo, the harvest, harvest time, the harvest goddess. Here she is, Demeter, Ceres. <clears throat> the image of the goddess in the sky. So denigrated in our modern idea. Virgo, Virgo I think, is among the most misunderstood and denigrated signs in modern, in modern imagination. She is actually the image of the goddess in the sky. There are only three feminine figures, three female figures in the, in the Greco-Roman sky that we've inherited. Two of them are in chains. Cassiopeia is chained to her throne, and Bonnega is chained to a rock, waiting for a man to come and save her. This is not, this is not a great image no. of the feminine. Virgo is the free woman in the sky, the only free, truly free woman in the sky. She holds the harvest goddess. She holds the harvest, the, 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 the sheaf of wheat that we need that feeds us. 
Even the Greeks didn't dare chain up their precious harvest goddess. And there she is, and we need to remember who she is and honour her as that, because she is incredibly powerful. And the idea of virginity that I talk a lot about in the book, you know, we've completely misunderstood what that is. You know, we, it's, it wasn't linked to whether, it wasn't linked to your level of sexual experience, it was linked to a, a rite of purification in the, old, in the old idea of that. You know, it was something that you did as a woman to, as a, a purification rite, you would withdraw your attention from, 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 um, from, from the male, from the masculine, from, you would come into yourself so that you could receive the divine seed. You know, I think there's a, there's a reworking of that that's important in our imagination to remember that this is, a, this is feminine. If, if Leah represents the masculine sovereignty, then Virgo represents the feminine sovereignty of the land, of the earth, of, 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 and, and, that, and that ritual ceremonial aspect that Virgo is so famous for as well. The shadow of Virgo, of course, is, you know, is the the, um, that everything has to be pure, that everything has got to be clean, you know, the sort of obsession that we have that everything being clean, perfect and pure. Puritanism, I think, is, a, is an expression of the, of the um, Virgo shadow in you know, the religious mood of Puritanism, which of course becomes the founding, founding idea behind America. And this, it's, it's out of balance, it's, like, it's out of whack, isn't it? And it comes out of a distorted image of the feminine that we've inherited. Uh, we, always show, we always show that scene in the Quran, we know to him he'd learn these key karate skills, but he hadn't learned them in his head, he learned them in his body. This is Mercury that we met in Gemini, inspiring our wit and intelligence, now, in, now embodied in the body, it's our, it's our physical embodied intelligence, that's what Virgo really is, it's the wax on, wax off principle. I discern, discernment is the key Virgo medicine, the ability to discern. I discern what is essential to my well-being, and it becomes my practice. I discern what is essential to my well-being, and it becomes my practice. Libra. Here we have the balance, the second equinox in the, in the wheel. The yin and the yang <clears throat> here. The light will now be overtaken by the dark. So we're entering the dark half of the year. But there's a balance. The harvest is now in, it's being weighed, this is one of the images, it's the harvest festival, so it's the weighing of the, of the, of the harvest. And it's also the weighing of the soul, and the weighing of the heart and the feather in the Egyptian story as well. It's the fall, the leaves are falling, but they're still, they've got that beautiful colour, haven't they? It's this beautiful, enchanting time. This is all by Venus. Libra is all by Venus, the goddess of beauty, and it's that beauty of autumn that seduces us. Even though nature is actually dying, we don't have to face it yet because we're just enchanted by the beauty, as if Libra and Venus are somehow lulling us into, across this threshold, into the dark half of the year. And um, Libra is about finding the balance within, being able to see both sides, being able to hold opposition and the tension of that within us. It's the equinox, it's the super beauty of the season here. And here's the weighing of the heart and the feather in the Egyptian story, which is a you know, and, and of course the consequences of, the, of, the, of, the, of these not being balanced are pretty horrendous. You know, this crocodile-headed character here is going to eat your soul, which is, which is the consequence of the imbalance. But we don't, we don't have, at the moment, what our concern is, is, is more idealistic. It's more about the balance itself. It's my art. She doesn't actually, there's nothing vindictive in this. It's simply the way things are. It's simply the balance. It's about things being in balance and how essential that is. And that's really, really what Libra is about. <clears throat> the shadow, of course, is not inviting discord to the wedding. This is what happens when Eris is not invited to the great wedding. And she brings her spiteful apple with her, her gift, that when she gate crashes the party and, and brings about the great beauty contest. And when the feminine is out of balance, or when, 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 the, when the shadow is not recognized because you want everything at the wedding feast to be in harmony, there's a consequence, and the consequence is the beauty contest, the archetypal beauty contest, when the feminine competes with itself, and vanity becomes the result of that. And the vanity of what happens in the beauty contest brings about the Trojan War, because Aphrodite wins, but in the, but in the process, um, Paris uh, is scorned by the two other, by Hero and Athena, who, 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 he, who he insults. And of course, this brings about the destruction of his kingdom. So there's something here about, about uh, Libra not, not brushing the difficult stuff under the carpet, but inviting discord into the, into the agreement. Because Libra is really about the agreement. It's how we find agreement. I come in peace, I walk in beauty, and I choose the middle path. 
to the Libra and Truth. And this isn't a compromise. Libra isn't a compromise. The compromise requires that we push the difficult stuff away. This is a creative middle way which can't be seen at first. It can only occur as a new birth that comes out of the tension being held within us. As Carl Jung said, when an inner situation is not made conscious, it happens outside of fate. When the, when the opposition within us is not made conscious, the tensions and difficulties have to play themselves out in the world. So the real alchemy here is to be able to hold those tensions within us so that they don't become... The shadow of Libra is conflict, really. It's a conflict that comes from not having really allowed both sides to be heard. I come in peace, I walk in beauty, and I choose the middle path. Scorpio. Now we face the consequence. Now we face what happens when those leaves that have fallen now rotting into the ground, the seed of life sown under the ground, as we see in the symbol, the M, the powerful M. Perhaps we have the M symbol in Virgo, perhaps representing the Madonna, the, 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 the Virgin image, if you like. Here we have, I always think this is the M of Magdalene that carries the secret sexual power, potency of, this, of the feminine. The seed, the seed of life sown under the ground in the underworld, requiring us to go down, requiring us to, to know the contents of our own shadow in order to know truth. For Libra, truth is beauty. For Scorpio, truth is truth. Deep, deep down in the soul. Water sign, second water sign in the wheel, requires us to go down. Water signs always require us to go down. But Scorpio more than any other, here it is, the pomegranate, the symbol of Persephone on her journey down into the underworld. These are the seeds, though, being sown under the ground, ready to come back in the spring. The seeds are sown under the ground at this time, even though we can't see, even though out outwardly it looks as though everything died. We know inwardly, you know, we, our work is, to, is the composting now, is the remembering of the cycles, the composting of the soul, as in the composting of, the, of, of all the waste material from nature as it, as it dies back. And the, the inner transformation has totally into the ego, which we see above here. So Sawin, beginning of a Celtic New Year, and where, where the seeds are sown, where we have to know our own dark place. And we don't want to look at that, do we? I mean, our culture is we just project it out everywhere. Mm -hmm. and look at the mess it makes. We have to somehow take responsibility for this within us. It connects us more closely than any other sign, Scorpio, to that dragon, to that, to that serpent energy at the heart of the wheel. The shadow here becomes the medicine. So, you know, I talk about the medicine of each sign, the shadow of each sign, but in Scorpio, the medicine is the shadow. Knowing the shadow, eating the shadow. But what I said, he said, we did not come here to remain whole. We came to lose our leaves like the trees, the trees that are broken, and start again, drawing up on great roots. I face my own shadows, and in so doing, I honour the death in my soul. I face my own shadow and in so doing I honour the depth in my soul. Sagittarius. The arrow now rising above the ground because now having gone into the depths into the most yin place in our, in our psyche, the deepest place in Scorpio, we now have to be pulled back up by the spirit. The fire always follows the water in the wheel because we need to, to recover the spirit in order to come back. And Sagittarius is where we come back. Even at a dark point in the year, as the nights are still increasing, they're now increasing at a decreasing rate. So we can tell by, what, by observing that although we're still going into winter, we're no longer plunging into it as we were in Scorpio, as the nights were increasing at an increasing rate, we're now coming back. And this is around, around this time now is where the hope is restored. Sagittarius is the restoring of hope and of faith that the sun will return. The archer, the fiery arrow, this is the, the Chiron, the great mentor of the heroes. Here we have Zeus here with the thunderbolt. We've got um, Artemis here, the wild hunter, the wild. This is the hunting time of the year as well. If you look on the, on the depictions of the, 12, of the 12 labors of the year, this is the hunting time, which is why we've got a hunter as an image, Sagittarius, composite image. It's the advent, it's the, it's the advent time in Christianity. Advent is the hope, the faith, and the anticipation of the rebirth of the Son, the rebirth of Christ. 
Okay, we've got the th you know, we've got the three the three three wise men or the three astrologers following the star. One star. Sagittarians will follow one star. You know, the, opposite, the opposite of Gemini. Gemini's are always juggling. They always know there's, a diff there's two different ways, at least two different ways of looking at it. Sagittarius, it's like there's only one way, and that's the way, and that's where we're going. Right? The arrow is trained in one way. So there's a, there's a you know, sort of incredible focus. <coughs> the shadow is a kind of fundamentalism. Well, it is fundamentalism. So if we could look at the religious fundamentalism in our world as, the Sagitt as part of the Sagittarian shadow, for sure. You know, because that, when that conviction is blind, blind faith, blind conviction, a disconnection, therefore, with what, with, with any kind of, with the intellect, actually. It's a, it's a, it's a blindness to intellect. The needing, think, thinking that you don't have to explain. You know, sometimes, you know, you ask a Sagittarian to explain how they know what they know, and you, really, you can really piss them off. Like, why should I have to explain? You should just, and just trust me. I know, I know what I'm doing, I know where I'm going. And often they do, because they have to be connected with the spirit, but... There's also that Gemini need, the opposite need to, to articulate what it is that is actually going on. Here we are, firing our arrow into the future. I know the way, I am guided by the stars, and I trust that my aim is true. We instill that in us, and we, and we have faith. Sagittarius has incredible faith that things will get better. The faith, it's Jupiter, the faith that things will get better. Capricorn. This brings the reality. The earth always follows the fire. The earth, the earth signs always follow the fire signs because once you've had the spiritual fiery awakening in the moment, it has to land in the body and be grounded in the body. And it does that very direct, very strongly in Capricorn. Capricorn, the sign of the winter solstice. The old goat. The old goat with the fish's tail. Linking us back to the earliest images of the first teachers that walked on the earth. That they were fish, they were cloaked in fish skin. They walked out of the came out of the sea, but they but they were often there was this idea that in the Babylonian idea that, that they that they transformed into a goat or sometimes an antelope or a horned a horned creature and they became the first teachers of humanity. So it goes back to really to the origins of things, this sign, <coughs> this image. Depicted as pan, it's a very it's a nature it's a real nature spirit, Capricorn. It's a deep, sensuous, earthy, um, desirous nature. But it carries the energy of the, of the highest spirit. This is the gateway that the, through the, which the initiates are born. Capricorn remembers that, that this is a, a place of initiation, or a place of, 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 of mastery. And it holds the responsibility in many ways for that as well. You know, that we have to be somehow responsible for what we've come here to do. Capricorn is the stand that you take. It's what you stand for and what you stand behind. And it's your willingness to step into the firing line, put your head above the parapet and go, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stand for this, even if it's unpopular, even if I become scapegoated. A scapegoat is, a, is, a, is an ancient Capricorn symbol. Christ himself was called the scapegoat. It comes from an earlier Jewish, the idea of the Azazel, the goat that was cast off into the wilderness. But this is a Capricorn image. <clears throat> and um, it's also the image of the, of the Sol Invictus, the unconquerable sun, as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so, it is December the 21st, by the sun, where the sun, at its lowest point, is gradually kind of carried back, brought back. Old, the, old, the old man of the zodiac, Saturn. Yeah, old Father Time carries the old wisdom that can be really cranky as well and controlling. The shadow of Capricorn is, I, I, I say, the end justifies the means. So that idea that you can, you, as long as you get, as long as you reach the golden road, right, you have to walk over to get there. We see that in the ruthless ambition in the corporate world and all of that. that is, it's the, the shadow of corporatism in Capricorn that we think it all has to be. Everything has to be structured and built. Whereas if that structure is strong within us, if that order is strong within us, then we don't need to impose that on the world because we have it confidently instilled within us so we can actually stand true to who we are and what we're here for. I carry the wisdom of the elders and the strength to complete the task I have set. Capricorn is the one sign that when they say they're going to do something, you actually believe them that they're going to achieve it because they will do what it takes in a dogged, determined way to reach the goal. They have the ability to begin and 
to complete, even though they will take their time to do that, because they know it takes time. And we all have that within us. We all have that capacity within us. Aquarius. <coughs> the waters of life, overflowing. I would say Aquarius is everything that spills over the top. <laughs> the overflowing jar. I, I, but there are, there are, I've chosen a feminine image here. We have got Ganymede here, which is the traditional Greek image of Aquarius in the sky. Here, feeding Zeus, who became the cupbearer to the gods. Um, but he replaced a, a feminine cupbearer, Hebe, who was, a, who was a Hebe, known to the Romans as Juventus, who was the fountain of youth. And she, she was the original cupbearer, and she represented that eternal youthfulness, that eternal spring. She was sacked by Zeus um, because apparently she embarrassed the gods by, by accidentally, we're told, revealing her nakedness. She dropped her tunic and embarrassed the gods. Very strange, sort of like weird sort of titillating schoolboy humour type of experience. And yet what, what was she actually doing probably was some kind of, this probably remembers some kind of early sacred rite of exposing the genitalia that you find in the Mesopotamian goddess rites. But this is, this is, this is twisted. This, is, this happens at a time when the whole feminine wisdom and the matriarch is being twisted, I think. And, and so she's sacked for this. She spills the ambrosia. That's the clue that she's Aquarian. She spills the ambrosia. And apparently because she spills the ambrosia, that's why she's also dismissed for that. But any kind of spilling, any kind of anything which spills is Aquarian because it's supposed to spill. You know, the, the, the sacred waters, the sacred nectar, the ambrosia is supposed to spill out so that it benefits everybody, not just those in control. And this is the deep Aquarian mystery, I think. And it's the snowdrops as well of, of, the, of, the, of the involved. The heralds, the Aquarians are the heralds of the future. The snowdrops are the first flower that come and remind us that spring will return. The brave. You know, like, what are they doing? There's still snow on the ground and the snowdrops are coming up. What, what are they doing? How are they so, how are they so brave and so, and so apparently insignificant? But they gather in community. They grow in little clusters, don't they? Like little aquarium communities. They bring the first light of spring, the quickening of nature. And they bring, and the Aquarius brings the round table idea, like the whole idea of the round table, the inclusivity of all the different perspectives is an Aquarian idea. It's an idealized energy. The shadow of it is a sort of disembodied, um, you know, when we, when, we, when we think we can appreciate everything from the top down, when we look at everything from above like an architect, looking and thinking that, you know, architects can design the most beautiful and amazing places, but not necessarily places that you can always live in, because you actually have to, you know, it's, it's an idealized idea, and that's sometimes that's part of the Aquarian shadow. <laughs> I, lived, I lived in that house built by an architect, it was so full of problems. <laughs> Um, I enable the waters of life to flow <clears throat> in service of humanity's highest vision. I enable the waters of life to flow in service of humanity's highest vision. We become the water bearers. We let all that inspirational understanding, all that community spirit just spill out of us. We become overflowing pots. This is, in, this is in Glastonbury itself with the two springs, the red and white spring of Glastonbury, are really symbolizing the two streams of water which switch at the Aquarian symbol. Pisces, finally, the last one. Here we have the two fish, one swimming along the horizon, one leaping to the northern stars of immortality, one fish reminding us of the endless round of incarnation, the other leaping to the highest heaven to be released from that cycle. Here they are, the two fish are always tied by a, by a silver cord, so that they will never lose each other. And we're caught in that current, you know, as we reincarnate life after life after life. We, 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 we come back together with those we still are connected to, and we're caught in that same current, whether as lovers, as family members, as enemies. We're caught in the current, and, we, and we're trying to find that, that, to transcend all of the charge that there is between us, to, 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 to dissolve ego back into the great ocean. This is the dissolving of ego, it's medicine. And Pisces is about the allowing the waters, just allowing ourselves to be dissolved in the great waters. It's meant in the Christian calendar, you know, the, the fasting time, the time of the denial of appetite. Because this isn't about, this isn't now about um, 
the appetite of the, of the belly, but the appetite, spiritual appetite now, that we need to in, awaken. Christ, the Piscean avatar, all kinds of mysteries there. His name means, means the fish, uh, Ixus. Some of you will know about that. In the catacombs, you see this, this image of the fish, Jesus Christ, Son, Saviour. Uh, this, this play on words with the fish. So he is the fish avatar, because you know, he brings in the age of Pisces. There's Odysseus, strapped to the mast. He's, he's a great Piscean. He's, a, he's, a, he's got the Vergoan wit. He's the clever hero. But he has to go through these Piscean experiences because he's been cursed by Poseidon, Neptune, the ruler of Pisces. And one of his most famous is when he meets the Sirens, a very Piscean experience where he, he, knows he's going, he knows it's going to happen, so he has, him, he has himself, he's forewarned, he has himself strapped to the mast so that the ship won't, so that, so that whatever he, because he knows he'll be out of his mind while the Sirens are around. But he wants to be driven out of his mind, doesn't he? Otherwise he would just put wax in his ears like he does in the, in the sailors on the ship. He stuffs wax in their ears, but he leaves his own open because he wants to be, he needs to have the experience, he wants to fall madly in love, he wants to be driven wild with, 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 with this desire that the sirens will, will draw from him. And there's a lovely image here of him with his, with his wild eyes. Um, but, he, but he has the wit, and he's, it's a lovely part. I mean, the whole Odyssey, the whole just, you know, he has Penelope weaving and unweaving the cloth back on Ithaca, as if she's weaving and unweaving his own soul somehow. I think I love Penelope. It's just his wife. She holds this great power as the feminine. While Odysseus is just being initiated by the feminine constantly on the Odyssey, and, and sort of and how all his, his his cleverness and his mind just transcended and dissolved. We can escapism is the great Piscean shadow. We just want to give we want to give up. We want to just get out of our heads. We want to just leave it all behind. It's just too harsh. It's too hard. We just want to be dissolved in some way. But compassion and deep deep forgiveness are at the core of. Pisces, the compassion and the deep knowing that we are all connected, that we are all caught in the same current, that we are each other. That's really the Pisces, and we are each other. I am not separate. I am one with all beings. And so the wheel concludes. I just conclude with this, with this lovely quote from Jacob Burma. The essence of God is like a wheel. The more one looks at it, the more one learns about its form the greater longing one has towards it, and the greater pleasure one has in the wheel. And there it is, there's that, that beautiful turning that's going on in us all the time. Can we hold all that the wheel brings us? Because everything's in there, it's, we're, it's complete somehow in there. If we can somehow work with each of those medicines, with each of those truths, and let each one live in us, we can become more compassionate for each other, for each other's strong suits and weaknesses, for each other's strengths and you know, sort of strong perspectives and, and, and where we struggle, and realize each other's gifts, and that we're all, we are all one as a community. This is, uh, this is the program where we're doing one more round of the alchemical journey this year. It's been called Zodiac Soul Journey. It's running out of, partly out of Wing Canton in Somerset and partly at Glastonbury on the Sundays, but if you want information, I've got a mailing list out there which you can sign up to. Um, so we're still doing 12 weekends, 12 full weekends, to really go into the mysteries this year and, and then to walk the land as well as part of it. And uh, starts, in, starts at the equinox, as we always do. Hope you found that useful, interesting. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. That was amazing. Um, I think that's the clearest exposition I've ever known of the Zodiac. And also, you achieved what you say about the wholeness of it. The first, that's the best time I've had a sense of it as a unity rather than individual science. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. Wonderful talk. <laughs>